for those of you that know, we've been going through a Navigating Life series. Who's been enjoying that? Yeah. Pastor, it's so awesome. Pastor Beck spoke such a potent message last week on having a relationship with Holy Spirit. Did you guys just get rocked by that and blessed? It was so potent. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break, a little hiatus on that, and today we're going to focus on first fruits, and next week we're going to pick back up on going after navigating life. Amen? Amen. We have a couple of more uh, Sundays left of that, and you know, if you just take all of these elements that we've been teaching, and rather than just picking a favorite, learn how to walk in all of these things that God has given us to do. See, I, I think I mentioned it a week or two ago. I, there was a song that I sang growing up, and it was so simple. It was, read your Bible and pray every day. Now, there's some other elements, but for a kid's song, it's letting you know it's more than just one thing. And when we can learn that it's multiple things coming together, we can walk with God. It's not just enough for me to own a car. I've got to have fuel in the car. H- hello. It's not just enough for me to have a car and have fuel in it. I've got to know how to drive it. I'm going to have some great photos, I'm going to have some Instagram envy, but I'm not going to have a whole lot of sense or safety, right? And everyone around me is going to be in trouble, right? So, so there's this culture that as we, look, here's the deal, if, if I know someone, when, when, I, when I met my, my would-be wife, the girl that I was dating, Rebecca, I wanted to find out what pleased her, not just with what I was comfortable doing. Oh, come, you guys, you single people are way too quiet. (laughs) Or do we need to do some single sessions? I mean, like, we can have some, we can have some chats about, like, you know, how to do this, but I'm pretty sure that people are going to understand the concept that when you are in pursuit of something, you find out what pleases them. Love languages, things that they like to do, and then you begin to pursue those things. And not just, well, they like flowers and breakfast and all these things. Well, I only like breakfast, so that's what I feel connected with. So I'm just going to do breakfast. Flowers can just go by the wayside. (laughs) Right? No, no, no. You have to understand, if you really want to win someone's heart, you have to be intentionally serious about what matters to them. But with God, he isn't just asking us to do things that make him happy. He's asking us to do things that cause us to live healthy, whole, strong, and blessed. I walk in purpose when I know his word. I walk in purpose when I have a conversational uh, lifestyle with God, prayer, right? And so all these things matter. We're going to pick back up on those next week. But today, we're going to go after our first fruits giving to God. In the midst of that, in the midst of that, as we bring our first fruits, I want us to partner our giving, in light of everything I've just said, our giving with our fasting, because a seed flies even farther as an arrow would when I partner fasting with giving. In light of everything I've just said, I can give and get a great result, but when I give and I'm in a a place of fasting and taking a hold of God, what do you have for me in the next season? What is your vision for my life? What is your purpose in this next season? What are the things I need to know that I don't know today? When I partner fasting with sowing, exponential breakthrough is coming. And it's really important to understand that while some of these things are inconvenient, they matter and you can't get to certain levels of growth and breakthrough without them. It's so, so important. It's kind of like, you know, I love eating chicken nuggets when I was a kid, but if you feed me broccoli, you know, we're going to have a tantrum. I've got little kids, right? I've got little kids. And see, the thing is, sometimes we're we're growing up little kids because if it's something like chicken nuggets, we're good with the chicken nuggets, but the second it costs me, then I'm looking at it as a multi-choice option. But once we start to understand that it is a holistic thing, It's a holistic lifestyle to bring these things together and run with the vision in God that breakthrough, blessing, prosperity, goodness, purpose begin to emerge in ways that were never evident before. Amen? Amen. So we're going to take up the offering today. We're going to receive that to the Lord at the end of the service. 
See, some of you were like reaching. Nuh-uh, not today. Today we're going deep with Jesus. Now, I grew up in a culture where when it came time to give to God, there was just basically a bucket that was passed around or a little, you know, I grew up in the old school where there was the little wooden handles with the red velvet little sock. Okay, that was what I grew up in. Okay, yay, good. But it was just passed around and people didn't understand, at least I didn't, I knew that I had to give to God because I had to give to God. But I didn't understand the culture of finances, I didn't, of kingdom finance. I didn't understand heaven's economy. I didn't understand the difference between having to pay my tax to God and bringing a tribute to my father. Because if I treat God like the IRS, I'm going to get an impersonal interaction. Because God only loves a cheerful giver, not a resentful taxpayer. Hello. See, I want to, if I'm going to give, I want to look for maximum yield. Now, this raises a topic that a lot of people come unstuck on. Why you shouldn't give to get. Says who? I'm gonna, can, can I have your permission? I'd just like to submit my request permission today. Just to mess with our heads a little bit. Because while we don't give to get, we give to honor, love, and obey, we also do give to get. Hello? Oh, it's gotten quiet in here. You were just shouting before in worship. Now nah, you're going quiet on me. Now, just a quick poll. Is it cold in here today? Half the room saying no and, and a couple of people are saying yes. So those of you saying it is cold, you need to get the Holy Ghost, apparently. I'm just, I just wanted to check. I just wanted to check. Okay, so I, I want to go through a quick study today. And I want to go through this concept of abundant giving. Because there is a place in humanity's culture and nature when if we go to the movies or we go out on a, on a little five-day cruise somewhere, if we want to take ourselves on a vacation, we go to a really nice restaurant, we want to get something really nice in the store, we know how to get lavish. We know even how to get lavish with a credit card and be foolish and get ourselves into debt to be lavish to ourselves. We don't even think about it. But the second it comes to giving, there's this little... It's, like a, it, it's almost like a muscle that clamps up. Just We become hesitant and reluctant. And when I say we, I'm talking about human culture, not heaven's culture. And... There's a place where generosity changes everything. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. Now, I can give randomly to anything and everything. I can give to trusts and causes and funds and all kinds of charities. And while that has a place, remember Cornelius. Cornelius, the Roman centurion, Gentile unbeliever, gave alms or charity to the poor in his city. He did not have a Jewish covenant. He did not have a faith. He did have a fear of God. But we don't really know what that looked like. But he gave in charity to the poor, so much so that there was a shift where the Bible says there there was a vision that took place, a dream. And the interpretation was his giving has come up like incense, like smoke of fragrant smoke before the throne and got God's attention. Now, a non-covenanted Jew at the time had no business being in the throne room of God. Did you hear what I just said? Because God was the God of the Jews. Jesus was crucified, Jesus King of the Jews. Hello. But something happened with this man called Cornelius who was generous and abundant to the needy, and it got God's attention in a way that God changed destiny. He said, because of this man's giving, the purity and the generosity and the kindness, the love that has flown from this 
circumcised, unbelieving Roman centurion, I am going to change the qualification of the blood at the cross from Jews to everybody. Now, that's some giving that changed my life. See, some of you are looking for Noah and Moses and Samson and all them people that did amazing things in the Bible. And I'm looking for them too. But when I get to heaven, I want to find Cornelius. And I just want to lay down a little laurel wreath of thank you to Cornelius. Because he was generous. And though I never met him, his giving has changed my life. Come on, somebody. See, when God has to reach past the people that should qualify and find someone that's not even qualified doing something that resembles his culture and override everyone else and say, because of this man's generosity, I am going to change the rules. Come on. Giving changes outcomes. Giving has to stop being thought about in the kingdom as a tax. And we need to start viewing it as an obedience and a weapon of honor. Come on. My giving changes destinies. So while we can talk about charities and things like that, which is what Cornelius did and they have their place, there's this place where I can purpose to touch God with my gratitude, love, trust, and submission as a son. And there's a whole group of people, we, we, we teach this. Like I said, I grew up in church where they passed around the thing and no one talked about it. The little bucket thing, the little sock, sock on a stick, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, someone woke up one day and was like, you know what, we're going to get a piece of wood, we're going to put a hole in it, we're going to stick some like purple velvet on it, and it's going to be holy. I don't know, it, it, it happened there for a minute. But no one really ever talked about it. I knew it was the right thing to do, but I didn't know that there was a culture of intimacy and a covenant that I could visit with aggressive generosity that would change my life. And when I began to discover this culture in God, see, I'm an extremist. If I find something good, let's go. I want to invest. If, if I find something, if I find an equation or a, or a system or a process that works, how far can I multiply that? If I can just like, well, I want to be conservative. Can it 2x? Can it 100x? Can it thousand X? Where can this go? How far, if God's mercy is new every morning, what are the boundaries of his generosity? If Solomon can kill a hundred thousand cows, bulls, in an offering to God in his first week of king, as king, and the person, not a mist, Moses got the backside of the glory of God up on Mount Sinai. Solomon got the person of God that walked into his bedroom, looked him in the eye in bodily form, and said, what do you want? I will grant you whatever you ask. Aladdin got stolen from that story. Think about that for a minute. They stole it from Solomon. God of the universe walked into his bedroom at night. Like, dude, I get freaked out when an angel comes into my house. God of the universe. Do I speak? Is it, uh, uh... What do you want? You have touched my heart with your giving with your honor of who I am. And I am here. I could have sent an angel, but I came in person to respond to you. And I'm not just here to say thank you. I'm here to tell you that your giving has triggered my giving. 
Your generosity has provoked my generosity. Ask anything you want. Some of you know I have a long-standing desire for an encounter like that. You should too. That's not, I I didn't take it off the board. It's not now not available because I want it. You can have it too. That's human thinking. It's called poverty. Well, someone else got it, so I can't get it, so I guess it's over, so I guess I missed out. No, everyone can get the same from the Father. He's not partial. He's not biased. Okay, so I want to talk about the culture. See, you are part of a kingdom. You're not part of a race. You are part of a family that is a kingdom that is ruled by a king that rules and made everything. Everything that will ever exist, who knows? He might make new worlds and put new people on them and have you steward new sons. I don't know. But if he's the creator, he's not going to stop creating because our world comes to an end. Think about it. He is bigger than our little brains. This is a big deal. But he has brought us into a culture. We have maybe grown in a culture that doesn't reflect his. So my mission on earth is how do I assimilate? How do I adopt his culture, his preferences, his characteristics into my life? Come on. This is good stuff. I like it. So we're going to go down a little road right now, and I want to show you how, because there's a lot of people, oh, well, giving and tithing, it's all part of the Mosaic law, it's all legalism, and it stopped when Jesus died. I want to show you that it's so much bigger. It's so much bigger. And I'm going to maybe say something to you today that God showed me this morning that I walked, I ran into the bathroom and said, babe, wow. My mind got blown this morning. I was just sitting there, God just talked. I'm like, I had to run into the bathroom and tell her. She was like putting her makeup on, like, what's going on? Like, I've got to tell you something. Are you ready? Are you ready to be challenged? Cool. Because I want you to be so challenged that you touch a part of God that something in your life changes this year. I want you to be so hungry that you take a hold of him in a way that he cannot but come to you with breakthrough with provision, with seasons shifting. This is not about a building fund. We, we don't think about that stuff. We don't think about the bills and the lights. That's not how we do this. I talk to a lot of pastors, and the first thing they say, well, our finances are doing good, and attendance is good, and da, da, da. And I'm like, I don't care about that stuff. Is he there? I don't care. Like, great, I'm glad that your business model's working, but is he in the room? Because that's all that matters. I don't need a business model, I need a king. If I got a king, I got the funds of a kingdom. If I got a king, I've got the miracle stories of provision and breakthrough that I don't have the ability to explain to people that think with poverty and logic. I gotta think beyond that. And that's why radical giving is designed to destroy my dependence on my bank account. It's designed to destroy my logic and my business training and all the things that I have depended on, which I shouldn't depend on because he should be my only source. I am a steward of these things. These things do not qualify me to be great. So I wanna talk to you today. And let's go down this road. I'm gonna move relatively quickly. (coughs) <coughs> the first thing that we're going to... So I'm going to basically go through the scriptures and I'm going to show you instances where this culture is in plain sight. Some of it you've heard us talk about before. Some of it we're going to just go through real quick. Okay, so Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. You don't need to turn there if you don't want, but it's Cain and Abel. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, literally in the biblical sense, and she conceived and bore Cain. I have now acquired a man from the Lord, she said, and then she bore again. She had a second son, and this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, he was a shepherd, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a gardener, he he, he farmed crops. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, 
and he did not respect Cain and his offering. Well, how come he didn't respect Cain? Because Cain was the oldest son. The firstborn carries the blessing, right? No, the right-hearted carry the blessing in this covenant. The heart after God carries the blessing. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, God himself came into the garden. God had told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat this fruit, you will surely die. Now, I personally believe, legalistically speaking, is that the angel with the flaming sword should have executed them. Has anyone thought about that lately? The angel should have executed them. But instead, God killed some animals. See, without the shedding of blood, there can be no atonement of sin. So God killed animals and then he made them a covering. He gave them clothes because they were naked and ashamed, remember? And they ate in a covenant with God. Cain grew up hearing that story. He knew that it was a blood sacrifice. He knew that only blood could atone for sin. So he was saying to God, you can take me as I am. This is what I've got. I'm going to decide what you get. There's my pumpkin. See, that's why the devil uses pumpkin on Halloween, for sure. Guaranteed. 100%. (laughs) Just having fun. It's okay. It's daddy's house. We can laugh. Get permission. Jesus give me a high five on that one. (laughs) But Abel, there was something in his heart that held the offering as sacred. And he understood that blood needed to be shed. Not because God was bloodthirsty, but that sin had to transfer from guilt to innocence. And Abel respected and reverenced and held that sacred. And he brought God what God wanted. He brought God the currency, the only currency that God could trade in. You catching this? So God respects Abel. It's not that he didn't love Cain, it's just that he couldn't receive that language. He couldn't receive giving on Cain's terms. He had to receive the giving on his own. Because God is God, and we are men. We're men. And so God is looking for us to adopt his culture, not hand to mouth. And too often we're in a time and a generation and the world that we live in is like, take me or leave me. This is how I am. This is my truth. But the reality is, is that this is such an important thing to understand that God is not moving. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that he's not changing because you have a good idea. Your pumpkin idea needs to change. And we need to get on his page. We need it now. Now we understand in what I'm saying here that Jesus came and he became the blood, the lamb, the 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 offering that would ultimately atone for our sin. But there's a culture here that we need to take a hold of. You catching this? So he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Shift and do this my way, and I will accept you. God literally came to Cain and said, just fix it. It's not a big deal. Just fix it. But Cain was indignant and full of rage. And now he wanted to kill the one that had done it right, rather than hold himself accountable for doing it his own way. Isn't that human nature? And then then God gives Cain a very solemn warning that there was a demonic sin laying at his door, the first murder that we know about. And Cain killed his brother the very next scripture. See, giving separates those that are in pursuit of his heart and those that just want to look right. Got to be after his heart. Because when I touch his heart, his hand moves for me. Too many people are pulling his hand saying, do this for me, God, do this for me, God. You don't get the miracles by pulling his hand. 
you get the provision, the breakthrough, the blessing, the answers by touching his heart. How do you touch a king? You don't try and seduce a king with some kind of flattery. You touch a king's heart with honor. And when you touch a king's heart with honor, they say to you, what can I do for you? Are you with me? Number one. Number two. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Someone getting something today? Hebrews chapter 7. See, we're going to bring, this is a time of year where we bring our first fruits offering to God as an over and above the tithe exceptional offering for God into this next year. Thanking Him for where we've come from. Thanking Him for where we are today. And sowing into what He will do for us in this next year. Shaka Baba. Blessed. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 7, I'm going to read from verse 1, and I'm reading out of the Amplified Bible. This is Abraham, okay? For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, I talked about him just a week ago, or two weeks ago. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, who's that? King of peace. Who is Jesus? Prince of peace. Priest of the Most High God met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of kings. Um, Abraham wiped out four evil, wicked kings. This is in the time around the Sodom and Gomorrah era. Abraham wiped them out. Okay? And, um, and, And so Melchizedek met Abraham and blessed him. And Abraham gave in as he returned, sorry, and Abraham gave him a tenth of all the spoil. He is, first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace, without any of record of father and mother. This is an individual that, now this here, if you haven't heard this before, this is going to mess with you a little bit. Because this is literally describing a king of peace who has no father and mother. Walking around in the Old Testament. Who meets Abraham and blesses him. What do you mean he has no father and mother? There's only one who has no father and mother. The prince of peace. Just like, oh by the way, just like the fourth man in the fire when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were in the fire... When they refused to bow. And, they said, and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar looked and he said, There is one having the appearance of the Son of God, or Son of Man, standing in the fire in the midst of them, and they are not burning. Jesus is popping up in the Old Testament without your permission before he was born. But he has no mummy and daddy. That's pretty serious stuff. Now, now look at this. Abraham... Who is, he is the patriarch, or he is the founding father of the Jewish people, the one that was promised Canaan before he ever saw, he really actually never got there. And he returns slaughtering four kings. So Abraham actually was very powerful. He was what most people would refer to, and I'm not even sure if this is politically correct anymore because things are changing so much, but he was technically like a wandering Bedouin king. But he had a small army, he was very powerful. And he was feared. I mean, to the point where this wandering king that has no city destroys four other kings and takes all their plunder. And as he's returning from that, he meets this individual who's a priest. And his name is Melchizedek. And he blesses Abraham. And Abraham bows and gives a tenth of everything he has just increased in. This is before Moses. There is no Mosaic law. There are no Levitical commandments. There is just people walking with God. This is amazing to me. I don't know about you, but this is mind-blowing. Every time I read this, I've, I've been reading this for years. Every time I read this, I just stop and go, wow. You break the rules and do it on purpose, and you're still in good place. Like, everything's okay. <laughs> Watch this. Without any record of father and mother, nor ancestral line, without any record of beginning days or ending of life, no death, but having been made like the Son of God, capital letters, 
He remains a priest without interruption and without successor. Hello? This is pretty awesome. Now, now the, I'm, I'm still reading here because there's a really important part I want to get to. Now, pause and consider. I'm reading out of the Amplified if you didn't catch that. Now, pause and consider how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave... Sorry, I just lost my place. But Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. It is true that those descendants of Levi who are charged with the priestly office are commanded in the law to collect tithes from the people, which means from their kinsmen, though these have descended from Abraham. But this person, Melchizedek, who was not from their Levitical ancestry... He wasn't in the priestly line as far as humanity is concerned. Received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who possessed the promises of God. Yet it is beyond all dispute, listen to this, yet it is beyond all dispute that the lesser person is always blessed by the greater person. See, sometimes we feel like we're bringing a blessing to God. Why are we really here? We're here for God's blessing. Abraham, think about this, wipes out four kings. And he brings 10% of four kingdoms and gives it to Melchizedek. That's not a couple of coins. That is serious plunder. And he is handing it to this priest. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham. They understood that the greater blesses the lesser. I am and will always be the lesser son in this equation. So I'm not here to be anything but submitted and humble as I bring my first fruits. Because I'm here for something more than checking a box. I did my job. I did what was right, now leave, leave me alone. I'm not a bad boy, right? It's not that. There is something in his words, in his eyes, and in his hand that I need on my life this next year. I don't have anything other than what he's given me, so how can I bless him? I can bless him with honor. I want to touch his heart in an extravagant way, not just in a duty fulfillment level. I don't just want to fulfill a duty. I want to extravagantly touch his heart. Is someone catching this? Let's go to the next point. Let's go to Leviticus. We're going back to the Old Testament now. Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to read from verse 9. Now the children of Israel, this is now the descendants of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph is born. Joseph ends up in Egypt. The children of Israel come into Egypt for grain during a famine. They end up becoming a nation of slaves. Up to three million people, they said, of slaves for 400 years. God liberates them through Moses and Aaron. They come out into the desert. They don't get it quite right. They worship other gods. They disobey. They won't believe. They doubt. They fear. But eventually, in 40 years of wandering, the season has changed. And it's time to cross Jordan and go to the promise that Abraham was given. Maybe nearly a thousand years earlier. You with me? And that brings us to Leviticus 23 verse 9. And God is speaking to Moses. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest... Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest or to the house of God. This is God speaking. This is not some man-made thing. He's saying, can I, just bring this, can I bring this into 2022 right now? When you cross over into the new year, when you start coming into your next season, don't come in arrogantly like you got you there. Remember who brought you, stop and have a memorial as you start to reap this new season 
Remember to give it back to the one who brought you into it. And we're going to get there in just a minute here, but there's something about having a heart posture where no matter whether I'm worth $5 or $50 million, see, the problem is, is that the pride of life, the pride of the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and the deceitfulness of riches will cause you to forget who your provider is. And if you can forget who your provider is, you will neglect your king. And you will live as an orphan, as an independent spirit, and you won't remain dependent. No matter how successful I get, guys, no matter how successful you get, I have to force myself. I must discipline and submit myself. I must grip my will so that no matter how successful the world may perceive me, that I will always perceive myself as dependent. I can never get to a point where my bank account causes me to believe I'm powerful. Where my bank account or my increase or my success or my notoriety causes me to not need God. Because that's really what it means. There's a, there's a proverb, and I believe it's Proverbs chapter, th- uh, chapter 30, I believe. And it's King Lemuel. And he says, God, never give me too much so that I curse you and don't need you. And never give me too little that I curse you for, for lack. You see, and grace looks like how can I steward abundance How much abundance can I steward and be a blessing so that I remain dependent on him? Because when I get a dollar more than my grace has caused me to walk in, where I no longer see him as my provider, my protector, my identity, the one that I look to for everything. The second I now see my bank account as a reason that I have power, as the reason that I am self-made. That word self-made is just Luciferian. Well, that statement, self-made. Oh, I'm a self-made millionaire. That's disgusting. Everything I have came from him. Everything that I will ever have. And if you, if, if you are at the bottom of the barrel, like I've, I've been in places where I've had terrible tragedies in business. People have ripped me off. I've lost everything. But even in that place, you have to have the same posture. Because if I can't steward a dollar, I'll never steward a hundred million. Come on, guys, because it's the same mechanism. I never want to be so blessed that I leave the grace. Now, here's the thing. We need to be a people that can walk in millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, even billions, and stay childlike in our innocence and grace. The second I have my eyes on riches, I no longer qualify to walk in what I'm walking in and I should be abased. You know, it's something that I've heard in business. If you're in business, you will have heard people say this or maybe you've been around, you know, I heard someone say it just last week. People that just think that their money is so powerful. I heard this person say, you know, I'll take you to court and I will win because I have more money than you. That is the most disgusting thing that someone can say. I I literally, in my business, I've had people that, they literally looked me in the eyes and they they were trying to rip me off in a deal and they said, I know it's not right, but I also know the courts are corrupt and I have more money and I can make this happen. See, that is a child of the enemy. There, There is no kingdom there. And I can never be so immersed in that world that I begin to reflect that. I must stay dependent. See, Jacob wrestled with God because he he relied on his strength to manipulate and to undermine and to supplant everyone in his life until God touched the socket of his hip and he became dependent on a staff. And I, I love that scripture because it says that when, when Jacob, whose name now was Israel, had had an encounter with God, when it says when he was an old man, 
He leaned on his staff. See, my encounter with God caused me to remember that I will always have a dependency. That I will never be able to be my own commander and destiny maker. That I will always remain soft-hearted. If you feel called to make a lot of money for the kingdom and that you just feel called to business, you have to learn this more than you learn business strategy. Business strategy matters. But if you build with the strategies of the world and you don't have what I'm talking about, you will ultimately fail. He leaned on his staff and he blessed his sons. And there's just something so redemptive about that because this man who lived out of his own strength, fighting every rule, bucking up against all of the healthy principles and morals and integrity and everything in his life, to the point where he was actually fighting God. God allowed something to happen where he remained dependent for the rest of his life and every step he took, every step he took for the rest of his life, he remembered, I have been like the lamb that kept running away. Ultimately, in in Jewish culture, Jewish shepherding, when a, a, a lamb would keep running away, the shepherd actually would break its leg and then he would carry the little lamb They'd bind it up and straighten the leg and he'd carry the lamb until the leg was healed. I don't know if you know this. And in the course of being carried, that little lamb would become so acquainted with the fragrance, the smell, the the, uh, pheromones of the shepherd that once that leg was healed, that little lamb would never leave the shepherd's side because the side of the shepherd is safety. And the second my independence becomes so strong, a wolf is going to rise up to teach me how wrong I am. And so with our finances, the finances that you have in your life are the fruit of your life's effort and focus. And so these moments where every Sunday we bring our tithes and and our offerings to the Lord, but there's something about consecrating a year. My greatness has not got me here. Who knows what was trying to kill me last year? What sickness, what disease, what car accident, what devil had a plan to end my life because of the gospel in my mouth? Who knows what was trying to end me, to cause me to quit? But God had invisible angel armies protecting me. Who knows what plane he was trying to pull out of the sky? Who knows what, who knows what calamity he was trying to bring into my family? But God held me and there has to be something in me that is constantly returning to the place of dependency. I depend on you. I look to you. Nothing in my sphere of ability or power, although some of us have been entrusted with great ability and great power, even that must be yielded. So look at this. We're going to go to this next next section. That, that, That right there was God giving Moses the command. When you cross that river and you walk through that water, When you come over into the thing that you've been waiting all this time for, because sometimes we wait a long time and then we get breakthrough and we forget who gave it to us. When we have those moments, instead of running off with an independent spirit, we have to ground ourselves and discipline ourselves into the moment of, I will offer you an offering of praise and gratitude, not just with a moment of, of my wallet, but with a lifestyle and a perspective and a harnessed heart that's yielded to you. You have the reins and the steering wheel of my life. I am not a freelance agent. Hello, is someone catching something today? See, first fruits offering cannot be some tradition. It has to be this living thing that pulls us back into accountability in our walk with God. Because, I, guys, we hear so many crazy... If you've been around for a little bit in this church, you know that the breakthroughs that we see, the finances are insanely crazy. And it's not just for two or three people. It just sweeps through the room. Just in the last few weeks, there's someone in the hair industry that's got $2,500 in the last four weeks in tips. Someone gave her $1,000. Another person gave her $600. Like, come on, guys. There's other people that have had 20 and 30% pay rises this last year. There's businesses that have quadrupled in the room. Like, this is not abnormal. This is the kingdom. Jesus didn't just make three bottles of wine at, at, at the wedding at Capernaum. When he, those five jars that he told them to fill, I've done the math. It's 2,100 bottles of wine on the wall, 2,100 bottles of wine. (laughs) And you know, (laughs) you know that was a good vintage. Hello? That was a good vintage. Because when God does something, he never does anything with poverty. Everything is abundant. 
It's how we steward it that will determine whether it lasts or not. Hello? <laughs> okay, now we're going to go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to try and wrap this up in the next 15 minutes. Someone catching something today? We're going to bring our offerings to the Lord. Ushers, if you want to just, um, if anyone needs a check or an envelope today, so, sorry, a check or cash, uh, an envelope for check or cash today, if you want to raise your hands, and I just want you to hold it. I'm not asking you to fill it out. Just raise your hands, and the ushers will bring it, because I just want us to have, I know many people have already been talking to the Lord and asking Him what, what He wants us to bring. See, with my giving, I know the Bible says that you can determine in your heart, but guess what? When it comes to God making the decision or me, I'm going to go with God. So I always like to ask him what he wants me to give. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, so now, now it's gone. The children of Israel, they moved in. They crossed over. Now you're about 400 years later into David has ruled. Now Solomon is ruling. Remember we just talked about Solomon. Now listen to what Solomon says. And this is in the early part of his life when he was still not so crazy, didn't have a whole bunch of wives. Okay, that, that's probably going to take you there. But we'll leave that there. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. This is Solomon. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Because here's the thing. To have, and I just want you to catch this for a second, and we have to deal with human sentiment that we actually own what we have. Honor the Lord. What is the Lord? The king, the God, the provider. A Lord in that time would have been a local king that ruled a province. That's why he's called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So he ain't your governor. He ain't your president. He is the king that rules all kings. So, so honor the king that rules all presidents, kings, and emperors with your possessions. Now that's an oxymoron because if I belong to him, then everything that's mine is his anyways. So it's a little bit of an oxymoron, but I want you to catch this. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, right? The first fruit. Now this is the guy that was noted as the wisest man that ever lived. I would take notes from the wisest man that ever lived. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Watch this. And here is why. And I want you to catch this. Remember I talked about earlier, we don't give to get, but we actually do give to get. So that your barns, sorry, I just totally lost my spot there. There it is. So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Give God the honoring of first fruits when you come into new seasons, when you come into inheritances, when you come into breakthroughs or huge payouts or whatever that looks like, honor God with the first fruits of that so that your increase, your, he talks about your barn, so your bank account is, is a good modern translation for barns because I don't know how many of you here have got a barn and a donkey and chickens, right? so that you will start to experience an abundance and an overflowing. See, I want an abundance and an overflowing in my life. Because here's the thing, when I honor God with the first fruits, Melchizedek, if I could paint a picture, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, comes into my world and he blesses all I have. When God blesses all I have, this is the God that said, let there be light, and everything had to obey him. I need God to come and say, let Andrew be blessed. Let everything he touched begin to turn to gold. Because this is someone I can trust, because when they get more, they give me more. And they're not just giving me more, they're honoring me and they're submitting to me. They are leaning on me. They are depending on me. And when I see a dependence, I see a humility that draws me close. And when I get closer, the blessing increases. Is someone catching this? This is not about anybody getting your money. This is about you touching God at such a deep level that something begins to shift. I need Cornelius moments in my life where God says there's incense come up from your life that has changed what's about to happen. 
What was going to take you 10 years is going to take you two. Come on. Seriously, I'm not trying to hype anybody. I'm just trying to tell you that there's different rules if you can touch the heart of God. That you come under a different atmosphere, a different timeline, a different dynamic where enemies will get out the way and begin to bless you. I'm telling you. And I know it's not easy because you can go through seasons where it feels like nothing but onslaught. But in a second, there's a shift coming. Point number five. This is the one that got me. So I just want you to just take out your little eight-point safety belt. ND 500, here we go. Are we good? This got me. And, and, and maybe it won't get you, but I, I hope it does, because it got me. It got me this morning. And this is one I've talked about a lot, so, so, and it's one that you know a lot. But you know you've heard me talk about John 3.16, where how God so loved the world that he gave God so loved the world that he gave his only, singular, his only ever begotten son, his only ever born son, Jesus, into the world that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. We know that. We know it very well. Unbelievers know that. A lot of them anyways. Okay? But then when Jesus rose, it says that he arose and ascended into heaven. He went through those gates we were talking about at the end of worship. He walked down the throne and Father was just like, Adam, my boy, get up here. You are awesome. All of heaven is celebrating you. I couldn't be prouder of you. Get up here and sit at my right hand. (laughs) See, Jesus ascended, came to earth the firstborn, sorry, came to earth the only begotten, the only born, ascended the firstborn now of many brothers and sisters. So, so let me say what, what God said to me. He used the seed of Jesus as a first fruit from his world into our world, check this out, to change his own season. God changed his own season. Never seen it like that before. He spoke it to me and I danced around. And I was like, dude, this is amazing. Because you just think God's static and he sits up in heaven just patiently, just doing nothing. No, he doesn't. He, the Bible says that he's always been working. He's active. He is an aggressive king. He's a conqueror. He's moving. He's going from glory to glory. He's looking how he can expand. Jesus told the parable of the talents, letting you know that you better not sit on your blessed assurance and do nothing. He's looking for you to grow and expand and become something. And God was separated from his children and he was in a season for a few thousand years on the earth where he could only have connection with one priest at a time. And he's like, I'm done with this season of limitations. I'm going to sow a first fruit. Come on. I have something precious. I'm not sending Michael to die. I'm not sending uh, Gabriel to die. I got the most precious and I'm sending my only begotten. I am going to change my own season sitting on the throne. Come on, this is getting me all excited. Woo! Are you serious? Yes, I am. Look at that and and catch this. You, You don't sow orange seeds and get mangoes. You don't sow bananas and get grapes. The Bible says in Genesis that every thing reproduced according to its own kind. Is someone catching this right now? So so there is a law of reproduction on the earth of seed time and harvest that God instituted knowing he was going to need it. (sighs) This ain't for Dumbo and Tigger at 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 the zoo. This is for kingdom atmospheres, seasons shifting. God sends his own son God, Son, Son of God, as a seed into the earth. The prize, the treasure, the admiration of heaven. Please step out of glory, Son. Please go away and I will reject you for a moment, Son. But in a minute, for the joy set before you, Son, 
you will not be my only son anymore. We are going to adopt. And we're not just going to adopt. See, adoption, you might look different than the parents. If you've been adopted here, you might look different than the parents that adopted you. But here's the thing. When God adopts, it's like there was never adoption. It's blood. The blood has come into me. I'm a new creation. It's not someone he felt sorry for and said, come into my house, I'll feed you and give you a bedroom. He said, now you look like my son. See, God is now reaping me and you. And when he looks at me, he sees Jesus' likeness. He's not reaping deflated beings. He's reaping the firstborn of many brothers. It didn't say the conquering king that redeemed the prisoners. It says the firstborn of many others like him. God sowed, listen to this, God sowed in the harvest language he wanted to reap in. He sees you in the value of Jesus. Please get this, because some of you have been living at very low levels about thinking about who you are. Some of you have been living at levels where you feel like I talked, I think I mentioned it last week, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, who saved a dirty, filthy, rotten, unlovely, ugly looking wretch like me. No, great song, bad language, honestly. Because while, yes, I used to be real ugly in sin, I am a son of God. I was, there was a seed that came, a first fruit, and now I'm the second fruit. I am the harvest from God's first fruit offering. And there are many of us. We are the majority. We are the emissaries of the throne. Guys, I'm trying to show you this is the culture and the language of the kingdom you are from, the kingdom you are in. And if you would stop seeing this like paying a tax, how radical can I get? Because the Bible even says, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. See, the way this needs to work, I like to invest. Okay, I like to invest in crypto. Not so much investing in the stock market right now because kingdoms fall. Okay, I'm leaving it right there, but just hear me on this, okay? When I want to buy a stock or a, or a crypto or, or, or some kind of investment, I'm not just saying I have this much money and I want to put in. I'm looking at the potential of what that investment could grow to. I'm looking at how much I want to make eventually, and I work the equation backwards to how much I need to put into today. Did you just catch what I just said? Some of you are like, if I know that this stock or this coin at a dollar could one day reach $100. How many coins do I need to make $100,000? Because I want to put a deposit on a building. Are you catching me? Is this making sense? How many coins do I need? See, so, so the same is true. God, what, do I, what am I believing you for? Because what I'm believing you for, I want to sow in that language. Radical giving gets radical breakthrough. Token gesture giving gets token gesture breakthrough. What kind of breakthrough do you want? See, that's why no man has left houses, lands, father or mother, brother or sister in this life, so, sorry, that will not reap 30, 60, 100 fold in this life and the life to come with persecution. Do you notice it said 30, 60, 100 fold? That's telling you that there's different levels of reaping. It's not a one size fits all society. God's not partial, but he rewards what you give him to work with. Because even God needed dirt to make Adam. He needed something to work with to make Adam. What do you want to give him today? I'm not trying to get nothing from you. I want you to get something in God that changes 2022 for you. What does it look like for there to be breakthrough? You believing for a business? What does it look like? You believing for a spouse? What does that look like? You believing for a new season? What does that look like? You believing for a new career? What does that look like? Believing for a pay rise, what does that look like? There have been years where I've been like, God, I've been earning this, and I want to earn this. What is the tithe on that? Oh, that's legalistic. No, that's me dreaming with God. That's me telling him, I'm going to pay you in advance. No, it's not paying, but you get what I'm saying. I'm going to sow my first fruit in advance for where I want to be. 
not just do the calculation and is it net or gross on today. But we'll gladly go to some bougie store and put money on a credit card to buy stuff that we won't even wear properly in two weeks. We won't even think about that, but I can use what I have to change my destiny, to change my future, to cause God to go, you know what, Andrew is touching me in such a deep way, I'm going to change some rules. I'm going to move the world out the way and do something for him that people around him look and go, oh my goodness, can, can we talk to you? We want to have a chat. First fruits offerings. I'm going to read a couple of things, then we're going to, then we're going to receive the, the first fruits of the Lord. Because if you've never heard about this before and this is new, this is not some cheesy televangelist deal. This is the kingdom. Jesus went to the temple as was his custom. And every time they went to the temple in that culture, they never came into the house of God empty-handed. Never. You simply did not go to the house of God with nothing to give. You guys understand that culture, right? I want to honor heaven because they got that from somewhere. I want to get, I don't want to be like Cain where it's like, well, I don't know about that. I've, you know, I, I've been hurt in the church with money and blah, 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 blah. Here's my pumpkin. <laughs> and it's like, why am I not hearing God lately? Why has God been really quiet? I don't know. Well, he doesn't like pumpkins. <laughs> Maybe he does, but not that pumpkin. Hello. <laughs> So there's different ways that you can sow first fruits. I'm, and this is, not, this is not the $500 seed, okay? This is not that situation. There's not 12 people in the room with $1,000. We're not doing that. That's not, that is not the kingdom. This is your personal walk with God in your heart where he's speaking to you. It usually will scare you because that's the part of you that's still depending on what you think you have when it belongs to him anyways. So I've learned to lean into that like, you know, if you go to the gym and every time that your muscles start hurting, oh, that's my time to quit. Well, then you're going to stay the way you are. Go to Dunkin' Donuts. Just have it out. Right? But when you push through the pain and you submit yourself to the resistance or the discomfort, growth will come. And I've just learned that when it comes to giving, God makes me uncomfortable and I have to be okay with that. We don't like the process, but we love the destination. So I've learned to be okay with the process. Hello. So there's a few things that you can just ask God, but some people it's the first paycheck of the year. Some people it's the first period of paychecks. Uh, sometimes it's a tithe on the year. Sometimes it's uh, money in your savings. There's times where God's come to me and said, see your savings account, I give me all of it. Shut up, devil. And I, I do argue with God. It's okay. But at least by the time I get done arguing, I really know it's him and I give up. You can have what you ask for. Right? Just You need to hear me say that. You don't need to hear someone perfect. Oh, everything's great. I get it right all the time. No, sometimes God asks me for stuff that takes my breath away and it takes me a minute. And I have to go back and forward with him for a week and he always wins. But it's, you need to hear that someone else has those moments too. You just need to hear this reality. We don't need to hear perfect stories that everything's just great and there's no personal struggle because God will come for your precious stuff. He will. Not because he's wanting to take from you, but because he has something bigger to get to you and that's the dirt that God needs to make Adam. Please get this. Please get this. Okay. Woo! I'm just, I'm just loving this. This is awesome. Is someone getting something today? And there's other times where we determine a sum in our heart. And we go, God, I want to bring this specific amount or if Holy Spirit's telling me. First fruits with purpose. This is my last statement. We're going we're gonna to land. We're going to bring our offerings to the Lord. We're going to bring buckets up here. If you're on your phone, just walk up with your phone. I just want you to walk up and say, God, here it is. I want you to see yourself, close your eyes, tangibly putting it into his hand. There has to be an exchange today. This is not a ritual. This is an exchange. This is not some tradition. This is me touching him in a way where something in me is marked and something in him is marked and there is a shift that's coming and I know it. It doesn't matter on the time. Once, once I've handed it to him, now it's his job. If it takes two days, six months, years, it doesn't matter. I've set something in motion with heaven and I'm gonna have that from him because I've done my part. I brought my tenth to Melchizedek. Now it's Melchizedek's turn to put his hand on me. 
be blessed, increase, prosper, destiny. That's what I need. How about you? That's what I need. I want the real king to stop everything. Stop holding, star- well, keep holding stars in space, but looking at me and saying, everything stops for you right now. So we honor, sorry, we bring our first fruits out of honor, out of sacrificial faith. It's not comfortable. There is sacrifice. You know, in, in, in the Old Testament, they would bring a cute little lamb and it would be culled on the altar. A sweet little innocent lamb, emotional attachment. Here it is, God. I'm so glad that he sent us Jesus. Killing a lamb on the altar to appease for sins is nothing compared to God having to look at his son breathing his last out. The whole sky turned dark. A four-inch thick curtain ripped in half that no human could ever do. Even with machines. Four inches thick was that curtain. It wasn't a thin curtain, it was four inches thick. Dead people came back to life and walked through Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Do you guys know that? There were dead people walking around. Jesus died. The moment he died, graves opened up. There was so much resurrection power, even before he was risen, that people were literally getting up and walking around and said, women receive back their dead. There's something about a seed in the moment it transitions from my ownership to his. Something in the atmosphere has changed. Something's going to tear. Dead things are going to come back to life. Come on. It might even look like hope is gone. I've lost something I was relying on, but something's about to shift. It can be, it can be a giving of thanksgiving for the season I'm walking into. And finally, it can be a moment of thanksgiving for the season I've just come from. First fruits, thank you for where you've brought me. Thank you for where I am. And I thank you for where you're taking me. Let's pray. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, God, that while the world is full of fear, that you are inspired with destiny and that you have so much vision over us. And God, we are coming to you today as the second born fruits of your first fruit harvest. And we are asking God, we're asking that as we bring our gift, our first fruit offering over 2022, our gratitude, our thanksgiving, our honor of your heart, and our calling for everything that you have for us and we're dreaming with you over this next year, that you would receive our giving, that there would be an incense that comes up from each person personally, God, that would cause you to stop on the throne in heaven, that would cause you to pause and even marvel at what is coming out of our hearts to touch yours. And the response from heaven this year would surpass anything that we have seen in the past years because you go from glory to glory. So what you did for me last year, God, is not the level that I'm expecting this year. It was the ceiling, but now it's the floor. And I have to thank you, God, that the breakthrough that is coming for me this year is going to transcend anything that I have experienced. I give you permission to shock me this next year with new levels, new boundaries, ceilings broken, God. 2022, I call for the breakthrough, the blessing, the provision, the protection of God over our lives. God, that you would cause accelerations. You would cause blessings, provisions, the right open doors to open, the wrong open doors to be evidently closed and evidently marked. Keep us on your path. Keep us on your trail. Rebuke the devourer. In Jesus' name, we ask you to receive our first fruits offering, God, and that you would roar with a response of harvest and breakthrough and blessing. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 If we can just have some, some worship in the, in the background. And I just want us just to, in a prayerful solemn moment. Let's just bring, if it's on your phone, still come stand up here in front of the altar and maybe just lift your phone up before God and just see yourself giving it to him. Let's have a moment with God right now. Jesus name. We just ask, I was praying earlier over just today that God, that everyone that was giving, and if you don't have the ability to give today, but something's in your heart, still come up. 
still come up. If you have something that you like, I, ha- I don't have it today, but God's told me that I need to do this and this is what I'm going to do, still come up and have that moment with God. Make that promise with God and say, God, I'm going to do that. And even as if I'm putting it in today into your hands, I'm not going to miss out on this atmosphere right now. God, I'm claiming what you have for me, that you would be the God of provision, that you would be the God of abundance, that you would be the God of breakthrough, that you would be the God that heals, that you would be the God that delivers, that you would be the God that opens doors that no one else could have opened. You'd be the God that protects me from my enemies, God. In Jesus' name, we thank you for 2022. We thank you for breakthrough. We thank you, God, for blowing us away with your lavish abundance. We thank you, God, that you are going to cause us to have a harvest in the language that we have touched you with today. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online, just receive this right now. In Jesus' name. We are a giving house. We are a generous people. We are a sowing people because it is your nature to bless. It is your nature to bring offerings. It is your nature to to pour out, even as you sow Jesus as your first fruit offering. We are sowing with the intention, not just to touch your heart, that's important to us, but because of everything that that means in this equation, God. You sow Jesus with intention to reap a new season for yourself. And we are sowing today, God, knowing that you have a new season for us, knowing that there's a shift, knowing that there's breakthroughs, there's there's higher highs and there's higher lows, God. We ain't going where we went before. We know that there's grace in everything that you have to walk through. Even the challenges and the battles ahead, God, that there would be breakthrough and grace on those in Jesus' name. So we thank you, God. We thank you that there is such a victory. I just feel this victory in the room right now. You guys feel that? There is such a victory in the room right now. We thank you that even right now, there's curtains being torn and there's dead things that looked hopeless that are getting resurrected right now. In Jesus' name, I thank you that our giving is touching your heart even right now, that you are touching us in a way, God, and that we are touching you in a way that's changing this next year. What the devil's plans were to hold us back, to slow us down, that you are just pushing hell's ranks out of the way in Jesus' name. Even over this house, God, that you would bring those from this territory that are supposed to be here, that you would bring uh, us a building, God, that we can really utilize to impact this territory. We thank you, God, that that will be one of the first fruits of this house. That will be one of the first fruits of this house, God, that you're gonna use us as as a family to impact darkness, push back and pluck lost sons and daughters into light, God, that they would come into this same kingdom that we are in and enjoying and being blessed by. So we bless you today, Father. We love you, and we are so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful that you decided to call us family and not just rescued ones. We're so thankful that we can operate in this principle with you, and we bless you today. We thank you that we're going home with more than we came with. We're leaving our offering at the altar, and we're going home with more than what we came with. We're going home with your blessing over our lives, that this year would be a year that's so notably different than any year we've ever had. In Jesus' name, we love you, God. Come on, let's just yell out, we love you, God. Woo! Jesus' name. Okay, guys, be blessed.